You know what? I'll admit it. I'll do it. I think I'm secure enough in my coolness to admit to unironically liking something mainstream. I like Christmas. I love that time of year. The snow, the lights, the brightly colored ornaments and extravagantly decorated trees, the staying in at night and drinking hot chocolate while huge fluffy flakes of snow drift down and illuminate the street with the softly refracted glow of the orange street lights. I like it, all right? It's magical. Fight me. Now, most people know the baseline story of Christmas, the whole birth of Jesus thing. But most people also know that Christmas is a lot more than that, with a lot of old traditions and suspiciously pagan-sounding rituals bound up in it. So let's take a hot minute this busy holiday season to talk about Christmas, what it is, how it got that way, etc., etc. So at its heart, Christmas's story begins with the story of the birth of Jesus. And most people already know this, but for the sake of completeness, let's give the quick rundown. The heavily pregnant Virgin Mary, having been magically impregnated by the big man upstairs, is out with her husband, Joseph, searching for a place to give birth. There are several different accounts of where exactly that happened, ranging from a guest room in an inn to a cave on the edge of town, but the short of it is Jesus gets born in Bethlehem, is laid in a manger because they have nowhere else to put him, and is immediately worshipped by all the local farmhands and farm animals in attendance. So begins the wondrous tale of Big J versus the world. But while this is the central story behind Christmas as a celebration, it's nowhere near the whole story. For one thing, why December 25th? kind of a random date, and given how many calendars we've cycled through, it's always kind of touch and go pinning down historical figures' birth dates with any degree of accuracy. Well, this is actually kind of tricky, like the rest of this will be. According to one theory, Christmas is December 25th because the Roman feast honoring Sol Invictus is December 25th, and it was an attempt to appropriate pre-existing festivities. According to another theory, it's the other way around. Kind of a you got peanut butter in my chocolate situation. But there's a lot more weirdness to Christmas that didn't come from the nativity. Where did caroling come from? Wreaths, Christmas trees, Christmas ham, Santa! Well, the first thing to know is that winter festivals were very common throughout Europe, and a lot of them got absorbed into Christmas over the centuries. Christmas being celebrated with a feast probably dates back to about 300, because prior to that it was actually considered morally wrong, or at least goofy, to celebrate a birthday with that much pomp and circumstance, especially the birthdays of gods. But after Christmas was established as a festival, with the spread of the celebration, traditions kind of started getting folded into it. One of the big ones is Saturnalia, a week-long Roman holiday honoring Saturn that involved a big public banquet, some sacrifices, some wacky role reversal social games, private gift-giving, and evergreen wreaths. But the bigger influence on Christmas is probably Yule, which is a Germanic pagany holiday probably honoring Odin, given some etymological links between his name and the holiday. Side note, the etymological root of Yule might also be where Jolly comes from, which is an oddly expected coincidence. Anyway, pagan Yule practices involved a huge feast, the sacrifice of a Yule boar, which is probably where the Christmas ham came from, a lot of drinking, and a few other heavily pagan associations. For one thing, Yule was somehow associated with the Wild Hunt, a ghostly procession of huntsmen through the winter sky frequently said to be led by Odin himself, which might be where we got the initial idea of a beardy old man flying through the air accompanied by horses or reindeer. Anyway, another later incorporation was the Koleda, a Slavic winter festival that featured caroling, bonfires, music, dancing, and a decorated evergreen stored in one's home. Basically, a lot of modern Christmas comes entirely from nifty pagan sacrifice rituals to welcome the spring. Evergreen decorations, specific kinds of cooked meats, caroling, gifts, all that good stuff. So in the Middle Ages, Christmas was celebrated in a similar way to Saturnalia. It had the role reversal thing, the big public party, stuff like that. But it also kind of took a backseat to Epiphany, aka Three Kings Day, or January 6th, which was recognized by some sects as the day Jesus was baptized. But oh man, if you thought we had a war on Christmas now, let me tell you something about the Puritans. See, the Puritans knew paganism when they saw it, and the Puritans were not on board with the pagan parts of Christmas, aka the fun parts, just like they weren't on board with the fun parts of anything. In fact, in 1647, the Puritan rulers of England banned Christmas, leading to some of the most hilarious rioting in history. They took over Canterbury and decorated the whole place with evergreens. And for more crazy facts, Scotland abolished Christmas for over 300 years, starting in 1640 and not officially calling it quits until 1958. Now, because a lot of the first pilgrims to America were Puritans, this led to some prevalent anti-Christmas sentiments among the early colonists, although it wasn't universal. Boston actually didn't start consistently celebrating Christmas until the mid-1800s, but New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia jumped on the Christmas bandwagon pretty quick. Unfortunately, post-Revolutionary War, Christmas was kind of thought of as a lame English thing and lost popularity in America again. In fact, George Washington used this to his advantage by ambushing a group of German mercenaries the day after Christmas, since they were all parted out and his forces weren't. Christmas gained popularity in America again, thanks in large part to Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which stressed Christmas as a time for family, generosity, partying, etc., as well as recasting people who disliked Christmas as unpleasant, miserly old folk doomed to die without fanfare or mourning. Which is pretty dark and a bit manipulative, but who cares, that book is great. Anyway, this is around the time that Christmas trees started getting big. Formerly, they were an early modern German tradition, but they were brought to Britain, and by extension America, by Queen Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz when she married King George III. Before that, the origins are pretty unclear. It might just be an extension of the whole pagan evergreen decoration thing, but it could also be influenced by Trees of Paradise, set pieces from medieval mystery plays that were decorated with apples, later replaced with shiny red ornaments, and used as backgrounds in plays about Adam and Eve. This is also around the time when the poem A Visit from St. Nick came out. 
you know, Twas the Night Before Christmas and all that, which pretty much introduced the idea of Santa Claus to the mainstream. But just like his holiday, Saint Nick ended up absorbing a whole bunch of similar related holiday figures. The base figure was Saint Nicholas, a 4th century Christian saint with a penchant for surreptitiously giving people presents. He was hybridized with Father Christmas, an English figure from the 1400s, serving as an anthropomorphic personification of Christmas itself. There's also Sinterklaas, a Netherlands interpretation of Saint Nick with a lot more saint in his image, and Jolupuki, which I am definitely not pronouncing right, a Finnish version who's got the red suit with the fur trim, the wife, the little gnome-like helpers, and he also might be connected with a Yule figure, the Yule goat. And an overarching figure bound up in Santa Claus is our old pal Odin again, who in true myth form keeps showing up in unexpected places in unexpected forms. Santa Claus has more than a few elements from the Wild Hunt concept we touched on earlier, including the unusual flying mount and the striking visual of a bearded old man streaking across the night sky. And in case you're not sold on this theory yet, Odin, among other things, apparently had a habit of entering houses through the chimney. So so yeah, while I doubt that little character tidbit will be showing up in American Gods Season 2, it's definitely fun to think about. Around the turn of the 1900s, L. Frank Baum, the writer of the Oz series, wrote a book called The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, which boosted the character popularity for Santa rather significantly, and also gave him a crazy backstory. I'd recommend it. I read the book when I was a kid, and I think it might have made me cry. Santa's modern image as a jolly old man in a red suit with white fur trim got solidified in the 1930s when he was rather infamously used as a Coca-Cola ad, which, while I will admit is a disappointing case study on the eternal struggle between consumerism and innocent cheer, is not the scathing anti-establishment message I know so many of us were hoping for, since Santa predated the commercial and Coca-Cola was not the first soda company to use him as a mascot. So yeah, in short, Christmas is basically a beautiful syncretic fusion of a whole bunch of different traditions, but they all share the ideas of partying, having fun, staying warm, and being with your families, as well as for some reason worshipping a modern cheery interpretation of Odin and decking the halls in Boughs of Holly. I'm not sure why those are the two universal factors that bind Christmas together. I guess you could take away from this the message that there's no wrong way to celebrate Christmas, because there's no right way to celebrate Christmas. The other message you could take away is that Odin shows up in the most unexpected places, but then again, anyone with even a passing familiarity of Odin would not be surprised by this knowledge. Merry Christmas, everybody! What's up everybody, it's that time of year again and you know what that means, more merchandise! We've got three and a half shiny new designs for you, a cozy winter vacation courtesy of the Underworld's number one power couple, a thrilling chase between Egypt's many sun-affiliated gods as they contend for the role of number one solar deity, and two variants of a design featuring everyone's favorite one-eyed trickster gods celebrating Yule in the fashion of the times. And of course, we've still got our old classics knocking around, so if you like wearing clothes or drinking beverages out of containers, swing by our Threadless store and give our cafe press a once-over. Links in the description and have a happy holiday!